Um, so we're gonna start off today in just a couple minutes with a welcome to our new Trekkie Police Chief, uh, Randy Billingsley. So welcome, Chief Billingsley, and we'll turn it over to you in a couple minutes. So we're thrilled that you're with us this morning. Um, after that, we're gonna spend about 40 minutes talking about our race and equity work. Um, we've been meeting with our race and equity subcommittee. Many of you were part of our meeting last month where we led a living room conversation. And I would just like to update you on the work that we're thinking about doing over the next year or so and get some feedback from you all. So we'll spend some time doing that. And then we're actually gonna spend the last, last hour of the meeting on updates. And so we are going to hear um, from Katie Mothersell with the Plaster Community Foundation around a vaccination messaging campaign. Um, we are going to hear from Raul Martinez with Plaster County and Jasmine from Nevada County um, with a quick update on vaccinations. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, housing and homelessness prevention. So Teresa Crimmins is here from Sierra Community House and Greg Geisler is also joining us from Plaster County to talk about some upcoming um, rental assistance programs. And then we'll have time at the end for resource sharing meetings. So that's how we're gonna spend our next couple hours. So I recognize it's an action-packed agenda. So I encourage you to like get up, get some coffee, get some water, take care of your, take care of your basic needs, do what you need to do. Um, so again, thanks for putting your information in the chat box. And um, so Chief Billingsley, we'd like to welcome you to the meeting. And um, before we turn it over to you to give a quick introduction and talk a little bit about the work that you're doing, um, Christina has designed a little poll based on some public information that your department shared yesterday. Okay. And um, so before we do that, Christina, I'm sorry, I, I forgot to turn it over to you for some housekeeping. So do you, do you have a couple of quick housekeeping notes that you want to share with the group? Oh, sure. Um, so it's really important for our reporting purposes that we have everyone fill out the demographic form. So I just included the link in the chat. So if you have not filled that form out yet this year, uh, please take a minute. It only takes a minute to fill it out. <laughs> And then at the end of the meeting, I'll also put in the chat a link to our evaluation form. I'll put it in the chat before the end of the meeting. Um, and we'd love to hear your input. So please take another minute to fill that out. Okay. Um, so Chief Bellings, we're just going to launch in. And so just so you all know, if you're on the Instagram, I found this little survey <laughs> of reflecting what Chief Bellings likes on the Instagram last night. So you all have a chance. Okay, to answer this survey. So your first question, is Chief Billingsley a night owl or a morning lark? And this is based on what you know about him already or based on nothing that you know about him. So just go ahead and answer each one. Oh, Christine, I don't know if I can actually, can you all access it? Are you able to take the poll? Okay, great. I won't, I won't participate in the poll. Okay, I can't wait to see what people have to say. <laughs> this is fascinating. Maybe everyone looked at the Instagram post. <laughs> so, do you like me to go? Um, in just a moment. Okay. We have. A, let's wait till at least like half the people have voted. Okay. Oh, we're racking it up. And then I'm actually going to actually since to, to give it like quick. Um, description of each one so I can talk us through that. Okay, really good work. 70% have voted. All right, Chief Billings, I'm going to start us down this path. So are you a night owl or a morning lark? I'm definitely a night owl. <clears throat> many, okay. many years of working night shift and working evenings and weekends uh, has, has made me someone who is typically awake to the wee hours. Point. I can see that that would serve your profession well. Okay, do you prefer coffee or tea? Coffee, without a doubt. <laughs> introvert or extrovert? Uh, it depends on the situation, but probably more introverted. But unless you, until you know me, then I'm, I'm pretty extroverted. Okay, sounds like a good balance. Okay, ocean or mountains? Uh, I'm an ocean guy. <laughs> well, only 11% thought that you were an ocean guy. So we've all learned a lot about you already. Okay, surf or turf? Uh, turf. Turf. Okay, and summer or winter? Summer for sure. Summer guy and ski or snowboard? Uh, ski. And dine in or take out? Uh, dine in, especially Excellent. with the lack of dine in over the last year or so, craving that big time. Right. Well, it sounds like a lot of our partners already know you or maybe already saw your, your survey on the Instagram. Um, 
So thank you for sharing a little bit about yourself. And now I'd like to welcome you to share even more about yourself. So um, welcome to your official role as Chief of Police and we're, we're thrilled to have you on board. Well, thank you. And it was great talking to you last week, Allison, kind of as a preview for this. And uh, it was exciting to talk to you about some of the things that we hope to do in the next uh, few years here at the Truckee Police Department. And one of, one of the things that I think that would is, is especially impactful to this group is that we're trying to initiate a community policing unit um, we're down a couple positions right now, but as soon as we're back up to staffing, I think we're, we're excited about having somebody who's specifically assigned to community-wide problems that uh, are identified by either constituencies or by council or uh, by groups such as this who, who feel that there's something that needs extra attention by law enforcement or special attention through maybe a, a special group project with either Sierra Community House, like I've talked to Paul in the past about, uh, or um, some of our homeless initiatives. Uh, and I know I've talked to some of the, some of the people in this group uh, extensively about that. You know, we, we really want to uh, go forward prior to this summer and uh, create kind of a, you know, homeless outreach team where the police department can collaborate with our community partners, our faith-based partners, and the county uh, with regard to uh, reaching out to the individuals in our community who are chronically homeless, the ones that typically, quite frankly, bring us the most challenge uh, in, you know, in dealing with quality of life issues that, that we, we typically get called to on a routine basis. So rather than kind of sitting back and waiting for 911 calls to come in, we, we'd like to go out and initiate activity and maybe even provide an opportunity you know, when there's not the warming shelter opportunities or uh, places where they can coalesce and, and get services where we go out to them and try to do the same. Um, those are kind of two of the big things that we're hoping to work on in the next, you know, six months, very in the very, very short order. Uh, the other big one that I'm going to challenge the community with a little bit too, as, as well as myself, is uh, Jen Calloway and I are talking extensively about creating a chief's advisory committee, uh, basically uh, of community, community partners of all walks of life to basically talk about the challenges in law enforcement and quite frankly, how we can do a better job serving you, our community. And you know, in the next few months, we'll probably have an application process. I'm not sure exactly what that's gonna look like, uh, but it will probably be on online where you know I'm going to reach out to some people, and I'd like to get some people that I don't know as well. Uh, and quite frankly, I'm not looking for people who are are necessarily always in agreement with law enforcement. I'm looking for people with different ideas who who might have challenges with what we do and how we do and why we do what we do. So uh, you know, I, I think it, it's basically an opportunity to create dialogue in our community, purposeful dialogue that represents our community and encompasses all the interests and perspectives that Truckee uh, has. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of an innovative way to get community dialogue around race relations, things that you're working on here and in, in, your, in, in, this, in this group. Uh, I'd love to be part of that conversation here as well, quite frankly. So um, we're excited about it and it's something that's gonna be developing. I think really what it will be for the people who decide that they wanna be part of it is a, kind of a community, um, a, a citizen's police academy on steroids, if you will. You know, something where we're gonna have complete transparency, transparency about all the different programs that the police department offers and some that the town offers and, uh, and look for input. And, and are we doing a good job in these areas? Are we, could we be better? Uh, what are the things that we do well? Uh, what can we what can we talk about in, in social media or communications of things that we can we can improve on? Uh, I think that's where law enforcement needs to go in the 21st century, especially after last year. And uh, we're excited to kind of create that dialogue. So those are the big ones. Um, I'm open for any questions or anybody if anybody's interested um, in in more information about the community advisory council idea, please uh, email me and I'd, I'd love to have one on one conversations to see if, uh, you know, people are a right fit for our for our group, it would probably be a group that would meet once a month. Uh, and would be an advisory kind of panel to help us guide, uh, you know, discussions on all sorts of issues involving law enforcement in our community. And, you know, uh, 
I, I just think it's really healthy. I think it's something that needs to happen. It, it should have been happening a long time ago. And quite frankly, that's where we need, that's where, that's where the future lies for us. Great, thank you. Um, and we can go ahead and put your contact information or maybe you can um, teach sure. us Sure, I'll put my there. email, I'll put my email okay. in, the, in the chat and anybody's welcome to email me. And okay. I'll be happy to email back. And does anyone have any questions? We have just a few minutes for questions so you can either raise your hand um, with the Zoom feature or you can physically raise your hand. Yes, Natalie. Um, the dialogue um, that will be sent out to the community, will it, will it be bilingual? Will it be like a Spanish one and an English one? So there would definitely there's there's definitely some discourse about that. I think what what I what I what I envision is <clears throat> having a group of eight to ten, maybe twelve uh, community members of all walks of life, uh, all 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 groups, and basically we would be meeting e probably online in the beginning via Zoom with some 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 basic topic areas pertaining to police use of force. Um, uh, community outreach, homeless outreach, things of that nature, and kind of let the group dictate where that where it goes in terms of uh, some of our discussion points as well. Uh, but absolutely, once we come together and kind of create some discussion, uh, I would be 100% open to putting that out there to our communities of uh, our Latin communities and all of our communities, quite frankly, in whatever medium we need to, to get that information out. Thank Great, you. thanks. And just a reminder for folks, if you're not on mute, if you could go ahead and mute yourself. So any other questions for Chief Billingsley in our last couple of minutes? Again, you can either raise, oh, Kayla, I see you have a raised hand. Yeah. Um, welcome Kayla, to your position. If, and if you just wouldn't mind introducing yourself and what organization you're with as well. Oh, sure, yeah, my name is Kayla Frank. I'm with Adventure Risk Challenge, which is a, a youth development nonprofit. Um, and I was wondering if you could say anything about like, in addition to the, your hopes for community engagement, um, and bringing in community voice, what, um, sort of trainings or learnings, um, or topics you hope to train your, your police force around this, this upcoming year or in the next five years. So <clears throat> there's, there's some that are, that are mandatory for us every year. In fact, um, that's, that's constantly changing. We're governed by the. Uh, California P Commission on Police Officer Standards and Training, uh, where every every law enforcement agency in the state of California has certain guidelines they must train on. They're called perishable skills, professional skills like use of force, um, you know, arrest control techniques, pursuit driving, um, communications is one where we teach you know basically teach people tactical communications, how to talk to people in a, in a respectful manner, uh, and. Uh, some of the stuff that we do and we will continue to do are mental health crisis communications. How do we uh, recognize somebody who's in, uh, in a crisis mode? You know, a, a lot of agencies, and I, this is one thing I'm proud of with the Truckee Police Department that we do quite well, is we've, we've been visionaries on this for a while, honestly, where a lot of agencies in California have not had that type of training. And you, you can see sometimes the the, the negative results that result from, you know, an agency that doesn't really at, at work in terms of uh, recognizing a, a crisis response to, to someone who's in mental health uh, crisis, who, who really isn't committing a crime, but is actually needs help. And how do we, how do we deescalate the, the situation through deescalation training, things of that nature. So we do, we do heavily, uh, we, we, we speak about deescalation training as well. So those are the kind of the main topics not, and then we also have uh, professional development training. Um, in fact, this year, the California Commission on Post Standards and Training uh, is, is mandating a new, new component where we are going to be having equity and inclusion discussions uh, as part of law enforcement. And it will be a statewide design program pursuant to our legislature's desires so that we can um, you know, better uh, advocate for all people quite frankly, and understand all, all, different, all different types of people that we inter encounter on a daily basis. So um, I'm excited about that. I think that's something that will probably out, be about mid-year. Uh, typically, training cycles for law enforcement are on an 18-month cycle. So sometime during this 18-month cycle, we will receive some 
uh, additional training at the state level to address some of those issues. Great, thank you so much. So, um, Claire, just one more minute. We have so you can bring us home with a, a last quick question. That would be great. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Reverend Claire Novak. I'm part of United for Action, a community coalition that is focused on the question of homelessness, particularly in this coming year. And um, it would we're trying to do a logic model about how particularly faith communities can address this problem, use our resources better to contribute. We're excited to hear about your interest and focus on that and wonder if you might send a staff member to one of our United for Action meetings, um, someone who has an interest in homelessness to um, you know, share ideas about how we might work on this problem with you. Absolutely. Uh, if you if you send me some con uh, your contact information, my email is in the chat. I'd be happy to <clears throat> assign somebody to attend. Uh, in fact, one of the other things that I'm I'm very excited about is we just promoted, uh, based on my promotion to chief, uh, I was able to create two lieutenant positions within the police department. And first time in the history of the Truckee Police Department, uh, we have a woman commander. Uh, so Lisa Madden is now going to be a Lieutenant of Police with the Truckee Police Department, as well as Danny Renfro, uh, who will also be uh, helping guide us forward. So one of those two uh, individuals uh, or myself would be excited to attend, Claire, to your, to your meetings and uh, have these discussions in more detail. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Well, again, um, welcome Chief Billingsley. We are thrilled you're on board and we look forward to um, working with you in the future and thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Allison. All right, um, so we are going to move on. Um, so Christina, if you wanna pull up the slide deck in just a moment and I'll, I'll just talk about what we're gonna do. So um, one of the things that we've talked about um, since the summer is how do we ensure that we keep race and equity in front of our collaborative um, in all of our meetings and all the work that we do, how do we ensure we're looking at our work as a collective through our equity lens? And one of the things that we do as a collaborative is that we use data to help inform our work as a group of organizations to help inform our community work. We've been producing a community report card since 2007, where we measure indicators in the areas of health, education, and economic well being. And so, um, one of the ways that we have um, worked to keep race and equity in front of all of our work is that we've been sharing data points at each of our resource sharing meetings. Um, that reflect something that's going on in our community. And so we, one of the things that we've been looking at is how do we really understand um, health equities, health inequities and health disparities during the pandemic um, and as vaccinations roll out. And so <clears throat> we've talked to many of our partners at Placer County, Nevada County and Tahoe Force Hospital District and really recognize um, that our main health entities have really focused on health equities in a, in a number of different ways. Um, so we, we really wanna honor that. Um, and so what we wanted to do is really look at statewide data that really reflects um, kind of a, some of the health disparities that we've experienced during COVID. And um, we had a harder time kind of finding county level data, although we are aware that that's available and we'll, we'll work to bring that to you all at a future date. But Christine, if you wouldn't mind going ahead and sharing your screen and I can kind of talk through the data point that we're gonna um, take a few minutes and look at today. And one of the things that we've talked about when we share data is that um, we really wanna do it with um, with grace and we want to really um, honor the groups that are reflected in this data and that as always when we talk about data at the collaborative like data shows one aspect of it but really there's a narrative behind it that helps us really understand how this plays out at a local level so i'm going to just talk through the data that's on the screen and then we're going to break you out into small groups of about four or five folks just for about six or seven minutes or so so you will have an opportunity to talk about this data um, how you've seen it reflect in the local community and any um, and the interpretation of it. So this data is available from the statewide website. The website's at the bottom of the slide and it's COVID-19 case and death rate disparities. And we know, and this is not new news for folks on this call, that COVID-19 disproportionately affects California's low income, Latino, Black and Pacific Islander communities, as well as essential workers, such as those in healthcare, grocery and cleaning services. So what this slide shows is the, um, disparities of COVID on our Latino population. So we know that the death rate is 21% higher 
for our Latino population than our overall statewide population. It's 7% higher for our Black people than it is statewide and 31% higher um, for Pacific Islanders. And we also know that the case rate for communities with a median income, which is lower than $40,000, is actually 30%, 38% higher than it is overall statewide. So again, just a data point that quickly reflects how um, COVID-19 has, again, um, disproportionately impacted our communities of color and our socioeconomically disadvantaged communities as well. Um, so what we're gonna do now is we are going to break out into small groups and so you can self-facilitate and if you could each just share um, how you've seen this data play out. Again, we are, I feel really fortunate that this has been a, a, at the forefront of Nevada County, Placer County and Tahoe Forest Hospital conversations and I've, I've been part of many of those conversations. So I think we are fortunate in our community that, that there's been some good work done and we would just love for you to share how you've seen it play out locally at a statewide level, any experience that you have. So Christina is going to go ahead and break us out into small groups. She's also going to put you put the data um, in the chat box. So you'll be able to reflect on that as well. Mind um, stopping sharing your slide for a sec. Thank you. Sorry, is, am I sharing my screen at the moment? Not anymore. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so welcome back, everybody. Um, so as we come back together, um, I just want to do like a very, very quick debrief. So, is anybody willing to share? some of the comments that you made in your small group or any kind of themes that emerge in your small group. You can just raise your hand or jump right in. I think maybe Harry might wanna share the location of those educational videos on um, the COVID vaccine 
through the hospital website so that everybody knows where to access those. We did do a Spanish only uh, presentation and I believe it's on our website. Uh, we make so many changes, I don't get to look at it every day, but uh, if anybody can't find that presentation, it's all in Spanish by two of our physicians and one physician assistant. Uh, uh, I, I think some other organizations were gonna take it and run with it too, to really educate uh, minority communities so they could first be informed and then you know, make a, a more informed decision, hopefully to consider getting uh, the, the vaccine. Uh, so that's part A and then part B, we're in active discussions with Blue Shield to maybe offer a bigger public health platform uh, for vaccinations in our, in our region. So that's a big project for us this week. Thank you, Harry. And then we also posted that um, your talk in Spanish on the CCTT Slack channel. Um, so I just did that yesterday. So I hope I did it correctly. So Christina, maybe you can help me make sure I did it correctly. <laughs> um, okay, Sam, comments from you, Sam Stein. Um, yeah, well, we talked about, obviously, there's a lot of things that we know the you know, racial economic disparities just with access to care, the types of employment people have. But one of the major things is overcoming this trust barrier after, you know, centuries and, and decades of, you know, being mistreated by, by public health systems, uh, the experience of communities of color going into, into the healthcare system when they can access it and being you know, treated differently and, and some of that mistrust is, is another major factor and it's not being addressed. And so it's kind of doing culturally sensitive outreach to those communities and, and getting them on board. And that's a major deficit to overcome because even now with some of the failures of the, the vaccine rollout and the mixed messaging, just that trust isn't there and, and you have to understand why some of those communities are, are hesitant uh, to, to access vaccines and, and public health care related to COVID. Great, thank you, Sam. Any other final comments? I think Natalie has her hand up, Natalie Zurich. Thank you, I'm, I'm, I'm not very good at like finding the raised hand when there's multiple screens, so thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Yeah, sorry, I can't, I can't find the hand button here. Um, to what Sam just said, I think what I love about this community is just like kind of during this we have this trusted messenger model right like we you, the government is needing us to fill out the census but just bringing it down to the local level and allowing um, local like organizations to kind of um, provide that information to the community so what Sam is saying I think that what's really worked is like getting the information and within our own families in our own organization that we disperse that information. We already have a trust there from the people that we work there with or the people that you work with and just helping other organizations kind of by providing their information and connecting you know, our families to that organization and just being like that middleman, that trusted messenger. I, I really think that, you know, that, that was, that is a, I, I like that uh, model. I think it's effective. And um, what I was saying in my meeting was just education and knowledge and just those connections are, um, are really important right now to help, um, you know, the, the people, the populations that we were talking about in the statistics that are more highly affected. Great. Thank you, Natalie. Okay. Well, thank you all for taking time and sharing your feedback. And again, we will continue to... Um, ensure that we share data points that you with you all that reflect how our overall, overall communities are doing and then work to disaggregate those as well by um, race and ethnicity. And so um, if anybody has data points that you've come across in your work that you think would be helpful for us to look at as a collective, um, please let Christina or I know and we'd be happy to share those with the broader group in this setting. Okay, so we have about 20 more minutes to talk overall about the work that we are doing as a collaborative around race and equity. So Christine, if you wouldn't mind sharing your slide deck again, that would be super helpful. Um, so I'm gonna talk for about like six or seven minutes and give a pretty high level update of the work that we've been doing. And then we'll break out into small groups so we can really get some feedback from you all. Um, 
it's, yeah, that's our, that's our process. So next slide, please, Christina. So really our goal for the next uh, 20 minutes or so is like I said, to update you all on our race and equity work. We'd like to get some feedback from you all specifically on a component that we're calling learning journey as of today, but we're in the process of changing that name. Um, we'd like to get any questions you have about specifically this learning journey so that we can produce kind of a, a Q and A that we can post on our Slack channel to make sure that um, we are answering our questions and understand what, where you have concerns. Um, and then again, just to solicit feedback overall on our race and equity work. Um, next slide, please. So again, as, as I mentioned earlier before I share the data point, um, kind of like our, our guiding question um, that we've been looking at as a collaborative, how do we ensure that we keep race and equity at the forefront of our collaborative and approach all our work through an equity lens? So we have um, a committee of folks who are helping us drive this work, who are helping us vet this work. So Elizabeth Ballman with Sierra Community House, Jasmine with Plaster Nevada County, Kayla with ARC, Teresa with SOS, Peter with uh, Gateway Mountain Center, Sam with Sierra Community House, River Coyote with Plaster County, and then Erica, who is new to our committee, who is with the town of Truckee. And so um, what the things that we've been focusing on through um, our work is again, providing data snapshots. So what we just did, Christina, I think we've done data snapshots at maybe like a dozen meetings so far since the summer, maybe more. Um, and so we actually have all those data snapshots in a slide deck if anybody's wanting to look at those. We are also working towards addressing all of our collaborative governance with the equity lens. And so we are going to, we haven't started this process yet, but ensure that our meeting agreements are um, created with the equity lens. We have a collaborative charter that's really our partner um, guiding document that we are working to update um, as of July 1 for the next three years. So we wanna make sure our membership agreements and our charter are really looked at through an equity lens. And then we're really um, working in conjunction with the community foundation. So as you all know, or maybe you don't know, but the, the collaborative is actually a program of the foundation. So we're really working to leverage the work that the foundation is doing at a programmatic level, at a governance level, and at a board level um, with the work that we're doing at the collaborative level, and then ultimately working to bring this work out to the broader community. And so one of the things that we're gonna talk about today is specifically a subset of this overall race and equity work, which we're calling a learning journey. Um, which we're in the process of renaming because our, our stellar committee members who are on the slide really pointed out to us that um, learning journey can sound very passive. And there's actually components which I'm about to share um, that we're, we're planning to bring to all of our partners that are much more um, um, kind of skill focused and actual tools that we can use within our organizations and within the broader community. So we're working to change that name learning journey. So that's why I kind of have it in italics because I think we'll use a different name moving forward. And so really, um, the, the plan for this learning journey, which I'm calling, like I said for now, um, is that it will probably be a 12 to 14 month kind of like learning process where we'll bring trainings, topics to our collaborative meetings, to the community foundation uh, board, to other foundation partners, then ultimately to the community. And really our goal as a collaborative, and I'm just gonna actually read because there's a lot of words on here, um, where it says CCTT, that's us, our community collaborative, so for us, our goal with this learning journey, which again, I'm about to unpack in a minute, is that we will bring learnings and tools about race, racism, and social equity that help our collaborative partners ensure that operations, governance, and programming of CCTT and partner agencies are driven by equity to dismantle structural racism. So it's a pretty um, lofty goal, and we really kind of needed an overall um, arching Goal to ensure that any, any trainings or any programming that we bring to you all really fits under this broader umbrella. Um, the goal for the foundation just very quickly is very similar, but it's very specific to the community foundation and focusing on um, the learning journey will be driven by equity and redistribution of power and resources to dismantle structural racism. And then the community um, learnings that we bring to the community are kind of further down the road, but we're really hoping, um, and this again may change, we are, we are learning as we go. Um, to bring learnings that enable local leaders to understand the history and dynamics of racism in our society, mm -hmm. recognize racist and oppressive structures and practices in organizations and the local community, and set goals and implement new structures and practices to realize the vision of a proactive and authentic racially and socially just community. So again, it's a lot of words. So all I'm focusing on today is this, this middle piece specifically with our collaborative and um, you know, before I, I talk specifically about this, like this is this is newer work for us. Like social justice has been one of our, our values as a collaborative for since we started over 30 years ago. And this very intentional work specifically around um, racism, structural racism, and looking at um, 
you know, policies that we make in the white dominant culture and how that impacts all of our communities is newer work for us. So um, again, like I just approach this with um, kind of humility and we are really open to feedback and really look at the wisdom of all the folks on this call and all of our partners to ensure that we are um, doing the best that we can in this work. So next slide, please, Christina. Um, so this learning journey again, and that will be renamed, um, but is, com is comprised of seven different parts. And again, we're currently working on like a time frame. How do we bring all this information to you all over the next 14 months or so, maybe a year and a half? Um, this is definitely a pilot. Like I said, we've never done this before. So we are leaning heavily on our partners on this call, other resources out there, but we really envision um, bringing different components of the learning journey to resource sharing meetings over the next 14 months or so, next year and a half. Possibly if we can't fit them in resource sharing meetings, have other standalone meetings. Um, we're posting all of our information on our collaborative Slack channel. So we're really um, ensuring that all this information is transparent and available to all of you. And again, we are open to feedback. So the first part of this learning journey, and again, we're trying to figure out the process, um, is to look at specific frameworks. So there's many organizational frameworks out there um, that agencies can use to infuse racial and social equity into your culture and programming. So um, we are actually currently looking at some frameworks and we envision bringing them to you all at our next resource sharing meeting, I think. Um, the next part of this learning journey is facilitation and holding conversations. So providing participants with tools, guides, and practice, holding conversations about race and being white in an anti-racism movement. And so again, we kind of dabbled in that part too at our last resource sharing meeting where we had that living room conversation. And um, you know, one of the pieces of feedback that we heard is like, how do we ensure when we have conversations around race and equity at a collaborative meeting like this, which is essentially like a, a, a public meeting for all of our partners, that we do it um, really in consideration of the impact of conversations about race on people of color and on white people. And so, how, how do we how do we how do we do kind of like a level set and say, hey, when we have conversations around race and equity, it can bring up trauma for a lot of people in a lot of different ways and how do we kind of understand what that is from the get-go. So that's one of the pieces that we've started unpacking. Um, the third part of this learning journey that we will bring to you all is again, um, history, US society. So the background on the origin on the concepts of race, racism in our laws and policies and understanding structural and strategic racism. The fourth part is internal. So how do we feel and perceive race and racism, bias, privilege and fragility? So many of you have already participated in like fragility trainings or um, implicit bias trainings. Um, I know both counties um, have promoted trainings as well that they're doing. So we look forward to taking a deeper dive into that as well. The fifth part is interpersonal. So how race plays out in interpersonal relationships, how to recognize racism and microaggressions, how to be in solidarity and speak up and how to accept and own mistakes we all will inevitably make. It all inevitably make. So part six, industry and field, examining how racism plays out in our industry, nonprofits and specific areas, so philanthropy, direct service, et cetera. And then part seven is institutional. So assessing our individual organizations, using a framework to develop and implement plans. Um, so that's a very, very quick um, overview of what we are calling the learning journey of, as of today. Again, we are, we are changing that name. Um, and then Christina, would you actually mind skipping ahead to the slide that says next steps? Because I'm mindful of our time. So um, I know I just said a lot of words, um, but what we're gonna do in just a couple of minutes is break out into small groups. And we would just love to hear some feedback. Like this is a very loose plan for the next, like I said, 14 months to year and a half. Um, I know that we're not providing a lot of content to you all at this point, but I just really wanted to ensure that I shared with you all the framework. Like I feel so strongly that we are a collaborative and we need to have as many voices as possible um, in the development of our race and equity work. So when we break out into small groups, I'm gonna ask, each group to have a recorder, if you're willing to make sure that if you have questions that you can record those so that we can kind of create a Q&A sheet, you know, just to address any questions people have about this learning journey. Um, we are also working to develop kind of a timeline and meeting flow. So again, there's those seven different parts, like how does that actually play out in our collaborative? Like there's a TTCF, a community foundation kind of ad hoc committee that's also looking at materials. There's our race and equity committee. We're gonna bring work to you all. So we just gotta kind of figure out like a, a flow for all this work. And then again, we'll post all this work on our Cloud of Slack channel. So in just a moment, we're gonna break out into small groups and um, Christine, if you could just go to the next slide. So if you could just have a note taker and even not a facilitator, but someone just to kind of move the conversation along. So um, we'd love for you to answer the questions, like these questions, what do you like about this like kind of framework, this learning journey, do you have any concerns? What's the most important thing we should consider when we're developing this learning journey and what are your questions? 
And so again, um, I would really appreciate if we could have at least like one note taker so that you could share those notes with us at the end. We'll have time for a very uh, quick debrief, but there's so many things happening in the community around like vaccinations and rental assistance. We wanna make sure that we have enough time for information sharing. Um, so again, yeah, Christina is putting the questions in chat box. And Christina, if you could go ahead and break us out into small groups. And then if you have questions in your small group, Christina, I wonder if I should actually be available for that in case you have any questions and you can raise your hand and I can hop into your small group and answer any specific questions. Um, okay, so thanks, Christina, for breaking us into small groups. And I look forward to um, hearing everyone's feedback. Allison, can you hear me? Hi, Katie. All the participants are in a breakout room and they are coming back in now. Okay, great. Use. Okay. What does this thing keep popping Thank up? You. Thank you. Go back. Um, so. Again, anyone anyone want to kind of share any any takeaways that came up in their group? And I was in, and for those of you that were note takers, if you could email the notes to Christina, um, that would be great, and she can compile those. But anyone want to share any quick feedback in our last couple of debriefing minutes? You can just jump in. I can I can share. Um, so one of the things that I've that came up in our group that I've heard a lot is. Being mindful about our community makeup, so having some emphasis on Latinx community members in addition to other disproportional or oppressed groups, um, and then thinking about the moving forward in kind of two different phases. One is doing more living room conversations where you can practice having conversations about a topic in a small group so that then you feel more confident going out and having those conversations out in the world. And then and then participating in, in actual trainings where you focus on, on an, a specific topic like institutional racism and, and learn about kind of the, the concrete elements of that. Thank you, Jasmine. The, the conversation is very similar in our group as well. Any other comments or feedback anyone wants to share? Sam? Um, yeah, so we talked about how we need to keep the digital divide issue uh, in the forefront when we're doing this work and accessing these communities so we're not making decisions about them without them. So that really comes down to old school organizing, boots on the ground, being in those communities, soliciting the feedback, uh, hopefully in person someday. And also just the importance of having representation in these organizations so that we have that cultural competence. So when you're signing people up for benefits that they may be entitled to, you know the right questions to ask to get them what they need. Whereas someone like myself, not being a community of color might not even know the right questions to ask. So yeah, just moving that diversity up. Thank you, Sam. Any other comments or feedback anyone wants to share before we move on? Okay. Oh, I can add, sorry. I didn't realize I was already unmuted. <laughs> Thanks, Kayla. Um, so in our group, we talked about um, additionally um, being provided with tools to be able to have these conversations and honing our skills, um, making sure that we're caring for 
community members of color who might be engaging in these conversations and have a different experience of it, um, but still having the conversations in an integrated um, group setting. And um, my group is asking for more clarification about like who the learning journey is for and particularly um, how conversations will eventually be brought to the community level and involving youth in them. Okay, great questions, thank you. So we'll make sure that we compile that into a QA and a as well. Okay, so um, note takers, again, if you could go ahead and email your um, comments to Christina, we'll compile a Q&A. We'll make sure again that we are ultimately posting everything on the collaborative Slack channel. Um, and I really appreciate everyone's um, thoughtfulness. Again, like this is very new work for our collaborative. It's very new work for me personally and professionally. And I just wanna make sure that we are um, doing the best as we can by our collaborative and ensuring that we have as many voices, like I said, in the development of this work. So thank you all for your, um, your honesty, your feedback. And um, I really look forward to doing this work with all of you over the next many years. Okay, so we are gonna totally shift gears now and focus on some very timely and relevant updates to our partners, to our community. Again, like I mentioned in the beginning of the meeting, I know we're covering a lot, so please feel free to stand up and stretch on your own, grab some water, um, see what you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, so we're gonna spend the next 55 minutes or so talking specifically about um, vaccinations. So in a moment, I'm gonna turn it over to Katie Mothersell with the Plaster Community Foundation to talk about a vaccination hesitancy, hesitancy campaign that foundation's rolling out that we can all be a part of. Um, and then Raul Martinez is with us from Plaster County. Um, Jasmine is with us from Nevada and Plaster County. And then we'll talk after that about um, some upcoming rental relief and homelessness prevention programs. And so at this time, I'd like to welcome you, Katie, to our community collaborative. And thank you so much for joining us this morning. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Allison. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm going to start sharing my screen so that um, I can go through some, some visuals of the campaign because campaigns are very visual and that's important. So we are a week in to this campaign that we've, um, that we've launched that the Community Foundation is spearheading, which is called Sleeves Up Placer. The, the, um, <laughs> What you see here with Sleeves Up Placer is really an extension of Mask Up, our Mask Up Para Tu Gente, which is a harm prevention program that we launched last fall. And so continuing on with that work, the next step is addressing vaccine hesitancy. And this I'm sure is not new information to anyone here that we do have um, hesitancy as a barrier. We know that eligibility is um, a process and there are people who aren't um, able to get vaccines yet who want to but there's also people who are able to get vaccines who are choosing not to and um, this is an area where public outreach community engagement community conversations um, dispelling misinformation can really help move the needle towards building more resiliency with more vaccinations in our community and we know that doing outreach works and people seeing other people get vaccinated also increases their um, their comfortable level of getting vaccinated themselves. So that's the objective of this campaign. Um, and the target for the community foundation in leading this is really about addressing the most vulnerable communities, the most at risk. And from the work that we've done on census, from the work we did on Mass Up, we know that um, there are Latinx community is especially vulnerable um, during the pandemic and also our low income target areas. And so that's where we're putting our emphasis and our focus. How we're doing this is um, trying to use all the tools in our toolbox for communications and community outreach. So first step is engaging community partners. So important, this is foundational because um, when you have a message that um, requires a high level of trust, um, a, a high level of listening, you need to have um, that messenger, you need to be engaging the people who already have those established relationships, already have that, that trust, and they're able to really be the messengers that are going to be most effective. And so we've been working with, um, the Community Foundation has lots of relationships with their nonprofit partners, um, both in Tahoe, we're working closely with Sierra Community House, 
Um, it's been wonderful being, you know, having Allison reach out. So we're connected with, with folks that are part of the collaborative and part of the, the community foundation there. Um, and we're going to be working with partners to put on online information forums. This is going to be um, a strategy where we want partners to be able to be those ambassadors, those leaders of our campaign um, in their communities and be able to deliver that message in a way that is comfortable for those communities to engage with it. And one of the things that we've been hearing a lot is that um, there is a, a, a big need, a hunger for accurate information or just to have dialogue around the vaccines. But we also know that many of our communities are not comfortable engaging, calling the county or wanting to engage in a broader conversation, maybe online. They wanna have intimate conversations where they feel safe participating. And so that's where we're, we're working to really build that piece of this out. Um, we're also going to be putting this message everywhere consistently trying to work together to amplify this message with as many voices as possible over social media, online, um, engaging our Spanish news media partners um, to promote this message. So it'll be a surround sound kind of effect going on in the background. And then we're also going to be delivering the messages through direct mail. We have affordable housing, low income um, complexes that are in Tahoe, but also throughout Placer County. I think we have 77 on our list currently where we're gonna be sending direct mail and trying to engage folks through text messages. And we're also gonna be engaging the news media. Um, part of this is also wanting to engage the business community, wanting to engage the um, education community, um, wanting to work with medical providers um, as much as possible. And all those conversations are just getting started, like I said, over the last week. And so um, the way that, that we're trying to keep in real time on this campaign and our communication about it is through an online toolkit. And that's where I wanted to do a little show and tell with you all to be able to show you where this is. Um, we are so grateful to our partners over at Sierra Community House who took this amazing picture. I mean, they look like superheroes. I don't know if you all can see it um, clearly, but um, they're you know, being featured in part of the launch of our campaign um, where um, we want to show those community voices in our graphics and asking people to be ambassadors. So this is where we're gonna head over to our toolkit. So you can see the landing page the Community Foundation has developed for the campaign that has messaging and talking points, but really uh, where I wanted to show you all um, where the resources are is underneath here under Community Outreach and Communications Toolkit. This is the materials that we've developed so far. There's a lot more that we'd like to develop, including um, real voices doing community appeals, um, people in the community filming themselves even with us in selfie mode to um, talk about their camp, their vaccine experience um, and posting that to social media where we can pr help promote that. Um, we have this basic collateral, it's available in English and Spanish. Um, we're really trying to encourage everyone as a, the most simple ask to support the campaign and support this message is by downloading or pardon me, uploading the their social media profile on Facebook with one of these frames. And um, you can, there's instructions here on how to do that. One thing I wanted to note about this is that what you see here is our previews, but you actually grab these graphics um, from Facebook and there's a whole variety in English and in Spanish. There's also versions that just use the hashtag sleeves up or the tag sleeves up rather than sleeves up placer to make it um, something that even our neighboring counties and communities can use. Here's a preview of some of the social media graphics and some of the myth busting graphics that we've developed. Um, this is our 211 graphic. We're building out some more, more messages around this. Um, for those who are not online literate um, or uh, need more support for getting an, a vaccine appointment, we are offering um, them to call 211 or get connected with the 211 text messaging system so that they can get help navigating that. And we know that community partners are also um, helping folks to get uh, signed up for appointments as well. Down here is where we have our social media toolkit, which um, offers a lot of our social media posts um, for our community partners to share. 
They're in English and in Spanish. That will be consistently updated as we get more messaging. And then there's also some key talking points. So um, this is something else that's going to be built out as we're hearing more from the community about what those hesitancy points are, you know, doing these forums and hearing about you know, where are the main questions and how can we address them? And that'll be updated here in that document. So Katie, we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, Christina went ahead and put um, the landing page in the chat box for everybody. Um, Great. Yeah, so if you could wrap it up in a couple minutes, that'd be super helpful, thank you. No problem. And, and this is, um, I wanted to just show these so social frames again, because we really want to encourage that in ways to become an ambassador that I already covered. And the only other point that I make here is please use the hashtags. And the reason for that is because um, that way we can track you know, the breadth and the reach of um, how our, our messages are being used. And we can see that, we can share it, and we can support each other. And the last thing that I'll say is um, I'll put my email address into the chat box because um, we really do want to hear feedback from the community. If you can um, message me directly with any suggestions ideas, other uh, messaging opportunities that we may be missing, we would love to hear from you. So thank you. And then Katie, I would just kind of reiterate what, we, what you kind of mentioned in the beginning that even though this campaign is coming out of the Placer Community Foundation, which is in Western Placer, it's definitely a, a countywide campaign and also available for our Nevada County-based partners as well. Um, so that people can take those social media posts and custom customize them to your organization or your specific need. Absolutely. So please, um, again, I'll put it into chat. Send me a message. There are opportunities for us to work with you and create um, you know, a, a, a version of the flyer that has your, your logo on it or something else that makes it um, useful to you to be able to take out to your communities. Message me and we can have that conversation offline. Thank you. So are there any quick questions for Katie? I know um, Lizzie put in the chat, but um, they could put some of the um, the visuals and the video monitors in the hospital waiting room. And that um, Natalie with the kids and we'll be following up with you specifically around outreach. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, well, thank you, Katie. I appreciate you joining us this morning. And um, this is the first time that we partnered with the Plaster Community Foundation this way. So I'm looking forward to it. And again, thank you for um, sharing the information with our partners and we'll make sure that we, we share the links um, in our minutes in our Slack channel as well. Really appreciate the opportunity and I just posted my email there and um, I will hop on off. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks, bye-bye. Okay, so now we are going to shift from vaccination messaging to an actual um, update on um, county vaccines. So um, Raul, I'd love to turn it over to you at this at this time. So thanks Great. for joining yeah. us this morning. Yeah, and thank you for the invite. And can you uh, hear me okay? Someone give me a thumbs up. Okay, We can perfect. hear you. Yeah. All right, great. And I'll just say, um, you know, uh, tough to follow uh, Katie, but I will, I will note that, you know, uh, Sleeves Up, um, you know, has its roots, not just in Mask Up, which was also a countywide campaign, but also in the Census 2020 outreach, right? So it just speaks to the importance of partnership, uh, bringing together the arms of the social impact sector. Um, and so really great uh, to see uh, that initiative come to fruition. So before I get to vaccine, I'm going to tease a little bit and do a bit of a frame and then I'll get to vaccine. Um, you know, so one of the things I'll say is like other parts of California and our region, um, you know, case rates and testing positivity in Placer County continue to decline, right? So we're reaching six cases per 100,000. That would put us in the red tier. 2.9% uh, testing positivity that would place us in the orange tier. And as importantly, 3.1% health equity testing positivity. So this looks at testing positivity in the 19 lowest quartile healthy places index census tract. So think of areas around Kings Beach, you know, the Greens in Auburn, uh, downtown uh, Lincoln, uh, uh, the downtown core neighborhoods in Roseville, for instance. To date, um, Eastern Placer has recorded 732 cases of COVID-19, which is about 4% of cases in Placer County and about 50 cases in the last 30 days. Um, you know, similar to, to Sleeves Up, we're really glad to have partnered with Sierra Community House and Latino Leadership Council in South Placer over the last eight months to help with case investigation, offering quarantine and isolation support by providing masks, sanitizer, food, et cetera, 
and amplifying those community messages. So Masca para tu gente, Subete las mancas contra el COVID, which actually was an idea from one of the community health workers. Uh, so they're actually naming the initiative. This is driven by uh, them, uh, particularly with, with the Latino community in mind. In late June of last year, the Latino community actually comprised 35% of COVID-19 cases while making up 15% of the population. And as of our February uh, COVID report, so the next one's actually due out this Friday, so stay tuned for that. Uh, the Latino community actually now makes up 13% of all COVID-19 cases in Placer. That represents a 22 percentage point decline uh, from uh, June. We can also report that hospitalizations and deaths, so both lagging indicators have fallen. Um, and as importantly, that Placer has not experienced uh, the same disproportionality among communities of color in these two indicators as we've seen uh, statewide. So with that as a backdrop, I'll now go to uh, vaccine. So uh, Placer has the highest uh, uh, vaccination per capita in the region. There have been over 116,000 doses uh, administered to county residents and about 33,000 doses have actually been administered at the HHS clinic down the hill uh, in uh, Roseville. Uh, beyond the HHS clinic, uh, residents can gain access to COVID vaccine at 18 pharmacies. So this includes eight Safeways from Lincoln to Kings Beach, uh, six Walgreens, two Rite Aids, one CVS, one Remedy RX, as well as uh, vaccination clinics run by Tahoe Forest Hospital, Kaiser Permanente, and Sutter Health. Uh, just this week, both Placer and Nevada allocated, I think, uh, uh, roughly about 2,300 doses uh, together of vaccine uh, to Tahoe Forest Hospital. As far as race and ethnicity data, so that re uh, race and ethnicity data reveal that half of those vaccinated uh, in Placer overall are white, followed by uh, multi-race at 14%, uh, Latino at 11%, unknown 11% and for uh, other racial and ethnic groups under 10%. And of those that have actually been vaccinated, over three fifths are 65 and older, right? So that makes sense. Those were, that was the first age group that was prioritized uh, in addition to sector-based groups. And we know that older adults in Placer are uh, more white as a share of the population than the countywide overall population. Down at the HHS clinic in Roseville, about 24% of those that have been served have identified as uh, Latino. You know, there's certainly work to be done on equity and access, um, particularly for folks who lack internet access or have trouble making online appointments. So 211 has helped particularly among older adults who lack a support system or who face a technological divide. And they, uh, you know, along with community organizations like Sierra Community House, Latino Leadership Council, Seniors First, Alta Regional, and others have actually served as navigators, uh, helping folks get information and in some cases actually make appointments. And we encourage everyone on this Zoom call uh, to reach out and help their senior loved ones too to, to make appointments. So we're all in this together. Uh, uh, two issues, uh, uh, you know, related to vaccine that we're tracking uh, closely. The first is supply. So the outlook here is sunny. Um, production uh, in the US was actually already slated to increase uh, for Pfizer and Moderna. And now Johnson & Johnson is a welcomed market entrant uh, that will boost uh, national supply by an additional 20 million doses. We'll see what kind of effect that has in, in, in classroom. We have some ideas about how we can use that to reach out to uh, special populations um, and hard to reach populations, including uh, inmates, uh, behavioral health clients, uh, homeless people, et cetera. And the, and the second is the role of the state's new third party administrator, Blue Shield, who is actually this week uh, starting to allocate vaccine in some communities and managing the provider uh, network, starting to manage the provider network. So Blue Shield is coming on as supply is increasing and uh, we're hopeful that they can incentivize providers to vaccinate eligible folks, you know, while building off the good work that local health uh, jurisdictions have done when the supply was low. So, um, you know, so, so March, you know, gonna, going to be a transition month. 
supply is increasing, we've got a new third party administrator, but as we look ahead to, to March and April and beyond, uh, the supply outlook continues to look uh, sunny and, and uh, uh, we, 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 feel, we feel good about the position that we're in in that certainly by uh, late spring, early summer, any adult that wants to get a, a vaccine can have access to it. Thank you. Thank you, Raul. I appreciate the very thorough update. So I think Jasmine, I'll turn it over to you to see if there's anything else additional from Nevada County that you'd like to add, and then we can open it up to any quick questions. Um, I guess, Raul, is, will Placer County be using my turn as well, or is that just Nevada County? So we're, we're still, uh, so we at the HHS clinic are using a system called uh, PrepMod. So we're not quite yet in the my turn system. We're waiting to see, uh, we're waiting for other communities to, to work out the bugs um, before we before it's our turn to go to my turn. All right, so I'll start talking about my turn. So Nevada County um, is starting to use my turn um, and I'll put the link in the chat in, in a moment, but that's the uh, state third party administrator is using that for Nevada County for appointment management. I know Tahoe Forest is a little different because they're using Placer County's appointment management system, but the Grass Valley Clinic um, that is administering vaccines is using my turn. They trialed it a couple of weeks ago. There were some bugs and they're still working that out, but I did go on the website just now to check what it looked like. And it's pretty easy. Um, you put in what your occupation is and your age, and if you have any vulnerabilities, and then it will alert you if you're eligible in the eligible tier to receive a vaccine. And then it will alert you if and when um, there are appointments available. And then the My Turn website will allow you to physically schedule the appointment. So that's for Nevada County only currently. And then um, we'll see if Placers uh, comes alongside, but they have a pretty good system in place. Um, not a lot of other new information other than what Raul presented. Um, I do want to note that we are, Nevada County is still in the purple tier. Um, so that means we have 14, uh, 14 or more new cases a day, which uh, per 100,000 people. So that puts us in the purple teal tier. In order to scale back to the red tier, we'll need to have seven or few positive cases a day. Um, and then that will open up um, some indoor dining and things like that. So we're continuing on the path to be to reducing our cases. Uh, we still continue to have new cases every day, um, but our hospitalizations are down, our um, active cases are down, and our number of, of active cases per day is decreasing. So I think another message just to highlight is um, with all of this wonderful, phenomenal news about vaccines and the benefits people are seeing, we can't get complacent because um, that is one of the things that may scale us back into um, moving backwards. So remembering to do things outside, wash your hands, social distance, wear your face covering, even if you've gotten a vaccine. Um, and so I'll put the my turn information in the chat. You do have to have an email, but there is a hotline number that folks can use as well if they don't have an email. Um, and to date, we've had 24,000 doses of vaccine administered in Nevada County, and this includes the first and second dose. That's it. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, so any quick questions for Raul or Jasmine? Yes, Kurt? Yeah. Yes. I have a question. Our primary yes. care is, in, is at Renown. So we were vaccinated quite early in Reno and we live in Nevada County. Is there a way that we can add our names to the statistics that have been vaccinated? We're, we're on the CDC's, uh, oh, what is it called? Where you report, uh, they check on us regularly, but um, I don't wanna be thought of as not a statistic in Nevada County. And I don't know if we should report it or not. All, is there the anywhere to? No, I mean, it's going to be tracked through through the county of resident or through the county that you got it in. So I, I understand the, the, the want to make sure that our statistics go up, but the more people get vaccines, yeah. the more our number is going to go up on, on, on a national level. And that's really where we want to get. Okay. okay. Any other quick questions? Okay, Kayla. Um, I think I saw a notification from Placer County that they're now opening up vaccines to um, agricultural and food service industry workers. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. And uh, right after this call, I'm actually on one of these on to to, uh, to talk to a couple of folks about uh, opening up to, uh, ag and and uh, food and, and food service workers. Yeah. 
Awesome. I just wondered if that might also change um, some of the, the like the racial disparity in, um, statistics that we have, that we might see more of our Latino community being able to access the vaccine as it, as it opens up to that population. So Raul or um, Jasmine, do you have an answer or was it just a general comment, Kayla? Yeah, okay. Question or comment, okay. I mean, is yeah. that what you're anticipating as well? I, I didn't hear a question. Um, are you anticipating that, 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 that opening up to those sectors will change the racial disparity statistics that were reported earlier? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly our hope, right? So if we look at, um, you know, additional groups and we're, we're, we're reaching out to industry uh, groups as well as to community organizations that have ties um, to uh, food and ag. You know, ag is not as huge, it's sort of as, a, a, a bit, as big as in other communities. Nonetheless, you know, reaching out to the Sacramento uh, uh, Latino uh, Chamber of Commerce, United Farm Workers uh, Union, and then also uh, making the, trying to make the documentation as easy as possible. We need some form of, of documentation, but we're not, hey, like, you know, communicating. We don't need like social security numbers. If, if someone can actually validate who you are and sort of do like a notario publico type of thing, you know, where you say, yeah, I validate this person. They work at this location. You know, that's going to be good enough for us because the most important thing for us is to get shots in arms, right, um, at the end of the day. So, uh, so we're certainly looking forward to that. And I think as more providers and the supply opens up, you know, HHS can go also, because right now, early on, we got a lot of people from that, you know, were members of Kaiser and Sutter wanting to, uh, to come to the clinic, right? So as those folks go to Kaiser and we want them to go to Kaiser, and so we'll be able to sort of fill in gaps, you know, that's, that's our, historically our place and, you know, what we're uh, looking forward to uh, in, the, in the weeks to come. Great, thank you, Raul. Um, so thank you, Raul and Jasmine. I know um, it's a lot of information. I appreciate um, your being with us this morning. Again, like one of the goals of this meeting is to ensure that our partners have timely relevant information to pass on to communities. And so um, Jasmine, thank you for sharing 211 information in the chat box as well. And again, we're putting all the vaccination information on our CCTT Slack channel. So it, it is COVID, but I think Christina, we're changing it to like COVID-19 like vaccination. So all the information will be there at your disposal as well. So thank you so much. So we're going to totally shift gears to like another very timely topic, which is rental assistance, homelessness prevention programs. Um, there is a lot coming down the pike. So I'm going to welcome Greg to the Zoom call. And then after that, we will hear from Teresa Crimmins with Sierra Community House. And so we have had about 20 minutes or so for our, our rental assistance, homelessness prevention conversation total. So thank you, Greg, for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. Sure, thank you. Thank you for having me. So, um, so I'm Greg Geisler. I'm the uh, Assistant Director for Human Services with Placer County, and uh, it includes, Human Services does the Housing Authority, um, which uh, primarily in its history has administered the Housing Choice Voucher programs. Um, people know them as Section 8, but more recently, um, this past year, we started uh, administering a tenant-based tenant rental assistance program. So when funding became available for uh, a new rental assistance program, uh, we were designated by the county to operate that. So some of you here probably have heard my spiel on this uh, a few times, but some, it might be brand new for you. And you also might have heard about this program from other entities. Um, because it's a little bit different than any other program we've had before. And the reason is, is that this was part of the, um, one of the, uh, the, the December uh, COVID um, uh, aid that Congress had enacted. And the funding comes to us from the Treasury Department. And the Treasury Department allowed local government entities to um, apply for this funding if they had a population of over 200,000. So Placer County did apply and we um, did uh, receive funding in about $12 million. Um, at the same time, uh, the state also applied and they received funding, obviously more than 12 million, but money that included uh, funding for the entirety of the state. So, uh, something that you might hear about is a state program. You might also hear about um, other counties or other cities programs. Um, but here in Placer County, our goal is to be serving 
our uh, residents first and foremost with the funding that we received from the federal treasury. So what is the emergency rental assistance program that I'm talking about? And, and oftentimes we'll, we'll just shorten it to ERA or ERA. So the emergency uh, rental assistance program, uh, uh, oh, there, there's a slide. So the emergency um, rental assistance program allows us to assist Placer County residents who are renters or leasers um, with both rental assistance and utility assistance. Um, we can pay back arrears to March of 2020 um, in both utilities and in rent. And we can pay future payments in both utilities and rent. And that will be for up to three months at a time. Um, Households must meet eligibility, and the eligibility is, aside from being a Placer County resident and being in a rental agreement of some sort, um, that the household has to have someone in the household that qualifies for unemployment or otherwise ex has experienced a financial hardship due directly or indirectly to COVID, um, demonstrate a risk of ex experiencing homelessness or of uh, potentially being um, at risk of homelessness or having housing instability. And the household has to be at the income level of 80% or below of the area mean income. We will have a priority for those households that are at, fit, at or below 50% and also for those households with a household member that has been unemployed for 90 days. So, um, one of the things that's going to come up most, and if you want to um, advance the um, slide, uh, is the um, rental assistance um, as far as the state or the county. So the Treasury, as I indicated before, had, in, had, had funded both us and the state. Um, our program has a little bit more flexibility than the program the state will be running. Specifically, we're able to pay 100% of the back rate rents, whereas the state program, at least as it is going right now, will pay 80% of the back rates and require that landlords forgive the additional 20%. Now, I, I will say that what I'm saying here is subject to change. The, we've gotten new directions from the Treasury during this period of time, and no doubt we'll get other ones as well, and what the state does might change as well. Um, but essentially, that's probably the main difference between our two programs, and it's why probably most of our, our, our residents would be better served by our program to begin with. Now, we're not competing necessarily with the state, and we are trying to coordinate with them for two reasons. Number one, to uh, allow us to be the first um, option and number two, um, to make sure that we are not both aiding the same household and paying the same landlords for the same thing. So in any event, uh, we do wanna be the first, uh, the first option for our, our residents and the state is supporting us in that. If we, if we exhaust our funding, then we will definitely be directing folks to the state afterwards. Um, if we can advance to the next slide. So the application that count, the county put in um, was uh, back in early July and in mid-July received the fundings. We have a, um, a tentative uh, live, which is the week of the 15th. What happens is on the 9th, which is a week from today, the Board of Supervisors takes up this item and we can't really ad advance until they give us the green light. Um, so again, what I'm telling today uh, is all predicated on their, their approval. Um, and with that, um, somewhere in the week of March 15th, we hope to go live. Um, during uh, this process, if, if the local governments are not spending all their money, the federal government wants to know about that and so that they can uh, redistribute the funds. 
So if it turns out come September, we haven't spent all our funds or we're not expect, spend, expecting to, um, then there may be a call to bring back the funds. I think that won't be a problem though. The program officially ends in December. However, there is an option for those already on the program to continue to receive um, uh, assistance for a further three months. So it could go through March 21st, 2022. So for those that receive the assistance, they're eligible, as I said, for three months at a time. Um, they can reapply if they continue to need it afterwards and as, fund as funding allows. So that's kind of the timeline for it. Um, if we want to move to the next slide. Um, the emergency rental assistance program here in, in Placer will go through our, our 211 uh, connecting point. We will be contracting with 211 and they will be giving us the referrals. So folks in need will contact 211 and then um, 211 will send those persons or those households our way. We are also contracting with the Roseville Housing Authority or the city of Roseville to also operate um, a, a, an identical program as we are operating, but for the residents of the city of Roseville. So, um, so again, the callers contact 211 uh, and then they refer the folks to us after doing a screening. And, um, and then we reach out to the households to complete the application. So that's kind of the intended process. And move to the next slide. Um, so this, that's how it is to begin with, but we also anticipate the opportunity for some partners in this process to help us in processing the applications. So those would include uh, different uh, community-based organizations um, that would process some of the applications maybe for the folks that they are working with. So in that case, we see the referrals coming from 211, not only to the housing authority, uh, but also to our partner application processor. After that, um, the applications come back to us, go through a QC process, and then the payment is issued to the recipient. So again, I will say this is all predicated are having it approved by the board. I think we're confident that that will happen and that we'll be able to go forward, but there could be um, a few things um, that change between now and then. We do have, as part of our board item, a um, request to be able to contract with community partners. So we are looking forward to that. When we open up, or it will be for, uh, it will just be us in, in Roseville, um, but as the uh, need moves on, we will be reaching out to some community. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, I know that's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. And there may be questions. Um, and there's probably things I didn't cover that are obvious um, that you have questions on. Um, so I am able to answer what I can at this point. So questions for Greg. You can either raise your hand or throw it in the chat box. No questions. Oh, except your email. Greg, if you wouldn't mind putting your email in the chat box, that would be super helpful. Sure, so Teresa, maybe at this point, we'll turn it over to you. And then if there's kind of questions in general about rental assistance for the entire community, we can, we can address those at the end. OK, thanks, Teresa. Sure, sounds good. Five minutes, yeah? Yes, yeah. If you need okay. more, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Teresa with Sierra Community House. And um, first, before I forget, I do want to introduce um, Sarah Jar. We have a new homeless outreach coordinator with Sierra Community House, and she's on this call. Hi, Sarah. So I just wanted to let everybody know that, that, that we've added to our team there. And then to speak to rental assistance specifically, I just wanted to give you over like a really, really brief kind of history of what Sierra Community House has been doing. So kind of during the before times, um, we ran a program that had um, income eligibility and rent reasonableness criteria. It's kind of a one-time, you know, one-month assistance. 
When COVID hit, um, two things happened. One, our community became very generous. There was a lot of uh, a lot of donors who gave to this sort of pool of rent relief. Uh, we were able to access funds through the Community Foundation, through the counties, through the CARES Act. And with that, the goal was really to bring down barriers and to become flexible with the funding because we recognized that um, people just needed relief kind of in an acute, immediate way. And so that's what the program looked like for the majority of 2020. And now, as Greg was sharing, there's sort of these um, additional supports that are available through, um, through the state, through the US Treasury. And so where Sierra Community House is at is in a place of wanting to help community members to number one, understand what their current responsibilities are under the eviction moratorium. So understanding you know, what you can be evicted for and what you can't be evicted for right now. Um, and then number two, to help folks up here match them with what is the best source of assistance for them. Is it Placer County? Is it the state program because they live in Nevada County? What's your AMI? Kind of where do you fit in this whole puzzle? Um, so that is going to be our goal. We also do still have some internal funds and our goal there will be to, you know, if there are people that don't quite match up for whatever reason because of AMI or because of something else that we have funds that we can use to help those folks that can't access those other funding sources. Um, and so at this very moment, we're, we've sort of put a pause on what our application processing looks like so that we can make sure that we're well educated about how to access these different uh, systems and to be able to help community members make those connections as well. So I'll just stop there, Al, and see if there's any questions. Okay. So questions for either Teresa or Greg about any current or future, soon to be future rental assistance programs. So I don't see any questions right now. I think um, my only, I don't know if it's like a question or a comment, but um, for one, like I really appreciate all the time that Greg and you, Teresa, and other folks on this call, Jasmine, have put into like trying to figure out how to best get these funds to the community. I know it's been a lot of meetings and a lot of time. And I just, um, you know, I, I think as we move forward and as the programs become available, like just ensuring that we are getting the information out there with the equity lens, that we're sending information out in English and in Spanish, and that we're making the information available to all community members at the same time and throughout through all of our channels. So if there's a way that we can help push stuff out through the collaborative and through the individual partners, I would just love to like make sure that we are staying on top of that. And I know that we are because we have a lot of meetings on Fridays about, about this subject. Um, but yeah, I just want to make sure it's at the, the top of our collaborative priority list. And I would just say kind of high level of messaging, you know, Placer is going to have a program probably likely with Board of Supervisors approval that's going to look a little different than what Nevada County residents can access and the, the big picture message is that rental assistance is available and depending on which county you live in, uh, more information will be available about how to specifically access that program. And Tiffany, I look at you, but you know, in, in sending people to 211, um, uh, yeah. Um, so any comments or questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you, Greg. Um, and again, we look forward to um, our next step with both programs. Thank you. Okay. So we are now, we have about uh, 